Greetings. I would like to first begin by introducing myself. My name is Lucas Mann. I am the pastor of the Spring Church, and uh, I'm out here with my friend Steve, my friend John, my friend Ed and his wife. And we uh, we come out here out of a out of a, de a desire to make known to you the gospel message, the good news of Jesus Christ. We're here to exalt the one who has saved our souls from sin, who has redeemed us by His precious blood. Ephesians 1, 7 tells us, In Him you have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. And friends, we want you to experience that same redemptive uh, salvation, that same glorious reality that has come about in each of our lives. We desire that you be saved from God's wrath which is coming, which is going to befall the ungodly. In fact, uh, right now we have millions of people evacuating the state of Florida because of an impending natural disaster that is going to threaten many people's lives. But that pales in comparison to the wrath of God that will one day be revealed against so wicked. That pales in comparison to God's judgment against the ungodly. But we know Scripture tells us concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in John 3, it says, He who believes in Him is not judged but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And so friends, we come here to make known to you who, who Jesus is, what He said, what He did to accomplish eternal life for His people. The angel told Joseph in a vision, or in a dream that he had in Matthew chapter 1, he told Joseph, he said, and you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. And so it is to the glory of Christ do we preach. And it is for His glory, His ultimate praise and honor, that we come out here this day. The, uh, the text of Scripture I'd like to direct your attention to this evening is out of Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. And this is what the Scripture says. The Apostle Paul wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And he said this, he said, Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And I would like to address that issue this evening that the kindness of God leads sinners to repent of their sin and to flee to the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith. That it causes those who are in need of a Savior to see their need for salvation. When one considers how gracious and how merciful God has been in sending His Son, sending His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to redeem a sinful people, when one contemplates no. the kindness and the mercy that God show, showed sinful mankind in that, it leads unto repentance. It produces the attitude of gratitude. It produces thankfulness. In fact, all throughout the Bible, our Christians are commanded to be thankful. And the, the chiefest thing we ought to be thankful for is what God has done for us in Christ. Is what God has done for us in His Son pinning Him to that cross. God bless you. Thank you. And uh, raising Him up from the dead on the third day. See, when one understands their sinful condition before God, and they understand that they deserve His wrath, that for God to be just, He would... Or if we, if we were all to receive justice, we would all go to hell for our sin. And for one to grasp and understand that, but to grasp and understand even further that God instead spared us and even now is sparing the wicked, is holding back His judgment, is patient towards sinners. And when one sees that He is doing that, and not only that, but has sent His Son, truly it moves even the hardest of hearts to be softened and to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, through His work at the cross, 
powerfully save sinners. That's why the Apostle Paul could say in 2 Corinthians 1.18, he could say, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the, the Greek word that is used there is dynamis, or dynamos, which is uh, where we derive the word dynamite. It's explosive. It's life-changing, the good news of Christ. The word of the cross is truly powerful and effective to save souls. And that is what the apostle has in mind here when he writes in chapter 2 of Romans. He's not talking about a generic expression of God's kindness, but a specific, special expression of God's kindness, namely Christ. In fact, uh, in, in relation to God's kindness, we also can consider the idea of God's grace. God's grace, that God shows grace towards sinners and He has shown it chiefly in His Son. In fact, Paul wrote elsewhere in, uh, in, in Titus chapter 2, he said, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly and righteously and godly. You know, what's so incredible about that text is that he uses the word grace synonymous with Christ. Christ is the ultimate expression and the ultimate display of divine grace. And it is that grace that ought to move your heart to repentance. Now before we walk through this text of Scripture word for word, I want to consider the context. I want to consider what Paul here is, or who Paul is speaking of specifically, and where he has come from. Well, in chapter 1 of Romans, he began by speaking on the depravity and the wickedness of the pagan, of the irreligious, those who claim not to have any, any religious affiliation and are just idol worshippers and indulge the desires of the flesh. And no one would contend the fact that they are rebellious against God. But then he directs his attention in chapter 2 of Romans toward those who are religious. And he says it doesn't matter. In effect, he says this in Romans 2. It doesn't matter if you're religious, you still need salvation. It doesn't matter if you're a, quote, good person, you need eternal life in Christ. Because as Romans 3 tells us, there is not one who does good. In fact, listen to what it says. It says those very words in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. It says, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. And so he wants to, to aim the cannon toward those who are self-righteous. And in fact, that's precisely what Jesus did in His earthly ministry. When we read in the Gospels, when Jesus had very harsh words to say and very harsh things to say, it was always directed toward those who were the religious leaders of His day and the self-righteous, the ones who did not see themselves in need of a Savior. And that's a timely message for the biblical South, for the Bible Belt where we have myriads and myriads of people who have gone to church, who have been raised in a religious atmosphere, who have had a religious experience, yet are without saving faith. They are outside of Christ and they are deceived. And they think themselves to be converted, but they're lost. This text is a very timely passage indeed. Because it gets to the heart. It directs, it goes straight to the issue of the religious, but lost. The kindness of God is what leads us unto repentance. And that's what I want us to consider as we look at this verse. Let's look at verse 4. He says simply, Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience? And this is, of course, a rhetorical question. The answer is within the question itself. And the answer is, yes, they do. Religious people do think lightly of God's kindness and grace. And they truly don't take it to heart and aren't truly moved to repentance, but instead have a thin veneer of holiness on the outside. But they deny the power thereof. That's actually what Paul wrote later on in the New Testament. He said that there are many who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. In other words, they have, a, they have the words, they have the outward appearance, but not the inward reality of a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Notice he names three things as well. He says God's kindness, His tolerance, and His patience. And these things can be seen when we consider our lives, when we consider creation. That God allows us to enjoy this world that we live in. To enjoy things like food. Enjoy things like the sunshine. A gentle breeze on a fall day like today. Or, or things like romantic love. All these things testify to the kindness of God. Because God is not obligated to give the sinner these things. We're the creation. He's the creator. He has the right to do as He pleases. And yet He, in His kindness, allows us to experience these things. Secondly, He lists, He says, tolerance. What does it mean that God is tolerant? Does it mean, as the liberals define the word tolerance, that God simply turns a blind eye toward the wicked and never punishes the evildoer? No, but God relents. He holds back His wrath when we deserve it. Friends, we deserved from the first time we sinned to be crushed eternally, to be lost because we had offended God and we had transgressed His holy law. But in His tolerance, He held back His wrath. And then the third thing He says, He says His patience. God's kindness, tolerance, and patience. The third thing, patience. That speaks to the longevity of God's holding back His wrath. He doesn't just do it for a short period of time, but He does it for a long time. Think about those who live lives of wickedness. Think about those who live lives of sin. And all throughout their many decades of immorality and swimming in the sewage of sin, did God hold back His holy wrath? And did God in His patience give them time to turn to His Son in saving faith? Indeed, and each and every one of us here today have lived, especially those of us who are older, have lived many, li uh, many years in this life. And God is constantly, even to this very moment, dealing with us in His patience. And He is giving you time to flee unto His Son in saving faith. To flee to Christ for eternal life. In fact, every moment God is holding forth His hand and Christ is saying, Come to Me! All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And He is saying it through the, the open proclamation of the Gospel as God raises up preachers and raises up men and women to exalt the name of His Son and to share the Gospel with the lost and dying world. Listen to the second part of verse 4. He says, Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. And this is precisely what I want to especially highlight this evening. That God in His wisdom has so ordered the economy of salvation to be that it is not necessarily His wrath and His hatred against sin that moves us to salvation. Although we ought to fear the Lord, and Scripture commands that sinners are to fear the Lord. We are to fear God because God is a consuming fire, as Deuteronomy 4 tells us. But that is not necessarily what moves the sinner to repent. It is God's kindness as it is revealed in His Son. It is God's grace as it is revealed in His Son. It is the love of God that has been demonstrated and manifested in Christ. That is what is to break the sinner's heart. That is what is to humble the reprobate, to humble the drunkard, to humble the sexually perverse, and to bring them into a saving relationship with Christ. Notice I said saving relationship. I didn't say a relationship. Aside from what preachers say today, you don't need a relationship with Christ. You have a relationship with Christ. The question is, and the question remains, is that relationship one of saving grace and one of peace, or is it a relationship of enmity? And are you at war with God? Because the Lord Jesus Himself said that you are either for Him or you are against Him. There's no neutrality with my Lord. There's no neutrality with the God of Scripture. You either worship Him or you don't. You either know Him or you don't. He either knows you or He does not.
and many of you may say that you know Him, just as those in Matthew chapter 7 will say on the day of judgment that they know Him, but you do not. And so it is my desire that God would use the, the glorious means of the preaching of the Gospel to bring you to saving faith in His Son. And to understand the kindness of God truly, we must begin our study of the Gospel and how God has manifested His kindness in His Son by first understanding who God is. Who is God? That's really one of the most important questions a human being can ask. Who is my Creator? Who has made me? And who has formed me in my mother's womb? And who sustains me every day? Who gives me life? Who is this God? Well, firstly, God is one. God, there is one God. As Deuteronomy 6 tells us, there is only one God. There is not multiple gods. There is not greater and lesser gods. There is one God. He's the true God of glory. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And this God exists co-eternally and co-equally as three persons. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. One God, one being of God, essence and nature, yet three eternal divine persons. That is the God of glory. The God who, who goes beyond even the greatest understanding of the greatest theologians and preachers who truly cannot be grasped fully. And that's a part of His glory. That's what makes God so glorious. In fact, the Hebrew word for glory carries with it the sense of weightiness. There's a weightiness to who God is because of His character and because of His incomprehensibility. Also, in relation to the attributes of God, what should we say? What should we contemplate concerning these attributes? Well, one of God's attributes is holiness. And the word holy means sanctified. It means set apart. God is set apart from all that is perverse and wicked and evil. In fact, in Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah is given the incredible privilege of beholding the Lord in His throne room in heaven, seated on His throne, and being worshipped by His angels. And I just want to read you what Isaiah wrote concerning this event, concerning this episode, that was frankly terrifying to him. He wrote in verse 1, or excuse me, I'll, I'll begin in verse 1. He says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated, uh, sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Notice here that these angels who are without sin and who are without defect are, are in God's presence covering themselves because they almost as if they cannot look upon the perfection of God, the, the glory of God, the holiness of God. In fact, they say holy three times. It is almost as if these angels in heaven could not find the adequate words to express what they were seeing. So they just had to repeat themselves in awe of God's beauty. And then in verse 4, listen to what the prophet Isaiah wrote. He said, And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out, and the temple was filling with smoke. The place is shaking. There was an earthquake. That is the character of God. And this is not the God that many people here in the South believe in. They believe in a false God. The, South, the God of the Southerners is more like a, a cosmic grandpa or a genie in a bottle. And you just go up and you just ask God what you want and He's going to bless you because He loves everybody and He's all grace and all mercy. And He does not have any holiness. This is not the God of Scripture. The God of Scripture is holy. Three times, thrice fold holy. And here the text clearly speaks to that. Also the Bible tells us that God is a just judge. That God renders justice 
in all things. In fact, the psalmist praised God in Psalm 119, 137. The psalmist said, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. God is just. He is righteous in His character. Absolutely perfect in His righteousness. God is eternal. He does not change. In fact, uh, we, would, we would also describe this as immutabil immutability. In other words, He does not shift from everlasting to everlasting. You are God, as the psalmist says. It is impossible for God to change. In fact, God uh, told the Israelites through the prophet Malachi in Malachi 3.6, He says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. It's a definite statement. He does not change. And as I spoke on already earlier, God is kind and gracious toward us. We see it every day in a very general sense toward all the children of men. We experience from, in one measure or another, we experience God's grace and God's kindness toward us. We also see, as I've already made mention of and I've already highlighted, the fact that God is patient. Even toward the wicked, He is patient. And God is love. Very true, God is love. 1 John 4, 8 tells us God is love. He is the personification of love. He is the definition of it. That's very true. But as I say oftentimes when I preach open air, God's love and God's grace does never cancel out His holiness or His justice. God's attributes are in beautiful harmony with one another. They do not contradict one another. And you cannot go to the Bible and say, well, I like these parts about God, but I don't like the rest. And so I believe in this God. You've just created a God who suits your own desires. You've just broken one of the Ten Commandments that God says you shall not worship any other gods but the true God. There is no other God but the true God. There is no other Savior, no other Lord, but the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the King. He is the King of glory. There are not many gods, but there is one God. And that's Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 8, 58, Before Abraham was born, I am. He's the eternally existing one. And He cannot be changed. And he, His rule cannot be infringed upon. His righteousness cannot be resisted. His justice cannot be fled from. For as Hebrews chapter 4 tells us, everything is laid open bare before His eyes. And He sees everything. He sees even the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And He knows mankind. He knows every one of you. More than you know yourself. Better than you know yourself. And there's many more attributes of God that I could highlight. God bless, God bless you, God sir. Bless you. God bless you, ma'am. Many more that I could make mention of this evening. But I know that time would flee from me if I were to do so. But nonetheless, that is a good picture of who God is. That's, that's how Scripture defines Him. We must go to inspired Scripture to see what God has to say concerning Himself. We don't go off of our feelings. We don't go off of private revelation. We go off of... A, the divine standard, the inspired Word of God, the infallible, inerrant Word of the living God. Which was written by over 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years on three continents in three different languages. And yet, it's in beautiful unison and harmony with, with each part one to another. And all, as a, as a great chorus together, proclaims, Jesus Christ is Lord. But nonetheless, going back to God and who God is, God has done something to put, on His, put His holiness on display before our eyes. God has done something, friends, and I want to share with you what it is. He gave us His law. He gave us His law. God's law is meant for a purpose. God's law is there for a purpose. And it is to bring about the knowledge of sin. 
to bring about the knowledge of our sin before this holy God. Also, the, the law of God shows us God's character. It shows us the characteristics, the moral standard, and the perfection of, of God. In fact, some of those commands in Exodus 20, God gave were, one of them was, in verse 3, God says, You shall have no other gods before me. That is the forbidding of idolatry. And he continues in verse 4, You shall not make for yourself an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. And then in verse 7, he even says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. That's, that's blasphemy. Another one God gave is in verse 13, he says, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That would be the, the forbidding of lying. These, these laws are given to us as God's standard of judgment, yes, but first and foremost, God's law shows us His character. They show us who He is. God says these things for a purpose. In fact, that's why in verse 4, or excuse me, in verse 5, when he, after He just forbade the Israelites from worshiping any other God, He says, I am a jealous God. The reason God gives these commands is because of who He is. Why does God say that you shall not murder? Because He's not a murderous God. Why does He say you shall not commit adultery? Because He's a perfect uh, covenant-keeping God. He, he's faithful in keeping His Word. Why does God say you shall not steal? Because God's not a thief. Why does God forbid lying? Because as the book of Hebrews tells us, it is impossible for God to lie. It is, it is in complete contradiction to the character of God. God is in, in the fullest sense, truth. He is truth. He, he has total, complete veracity. And there is not a spot or blemish or any such thing upon His moral perfection. So the law shows us, it is like a mirror, you could say, that reflects to us the image of God's perfect character. But also, the law of God shows us something else. And it is our character in, in light of the, of the character of God. It is, it is our wickedness in light of the perfection of God's holiness. So these commands, let's look at the first one I just read off. When God says in verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. Have you ever worshipped or loved and desired something more than you worshipped the God of glory and desired the God of truth? Or have you ever made up a God in your own mind and fashioned an idol in your heart that suits your passions and lusts. Both of those things are idolatry. And it is a trampling underfoot of God's perfect law. And it is an affront and an offense to His character. Also, verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I'm shocked, really, how many so-called Christians I see blaspheme my Lord's name. Use it in a sentence in the place of a four-letter curse word. In fact, it's an interesting thing is when you hear unbelievers talk, they'll often curse and blaspheme Jesus, and yet they don't claim to believe in Him. Why do they use His name as a curse? Why don't they curse Allah? Why don't they curse Muhammad? It's because they know He's not real, but they know the God of glory is real. He has revealed Himself to be real to them. And they reject and suppress that truth in their unrighteousness. If you've ever taken God's name in vain, you've blasphemed God and you deserve punishment for your sin. Verse 13, You shall not murder. And you may say, Well, listen, Lucas, I've never committed murder. I've never taken someone's life for an unjust cause. I understand that. I really do. If you've never been convicted of that, I'm not going to say that you have. However, Jesus came along in Matthew 5 and He said this, If you have anger in your heart toward your brother, God equates it with murder. He sees it as if you're a murderer. In fact, Jesus said there that you are worthy to be thrown into the unquenchable fires of hell. So God, in, in seeing even your heart and your mind and the intents of your heart, sees you as a murderer. 
Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Again, you may say, I have always been faithful to my spouse. However, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, in that same chapter that I just referenced, He said that if you look at a woman with lust for her, then you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. And that goes for women too. If you look at a man with lust, you commit adultery in the heart. God sees the mind, friends. He sees the heart. And as Genesis 6-5 tells us, He sees that every intent of the heart of man is to do evil continually. He does not see inherent good. He does not see inherent righteousness. You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen? Then you're guilty of this law, of breaking this law. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, a.k.a. lying. You shall not lie. The book of Revelation tells us that every liar will have their place in the lake of fire. Dear friends, I, I'm warning you, I don't want you to perish in your sins. Don't die in your sins. But instead, flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. The flood of God's wrath will drown the wicked, but the ark of salvation, Jesus Christ, has been prepared in the sight of all the peoples of the earth. And as Isaiah wrote, look to me all the ends of the earth and be saved. Dear friends, look to the Lord Jesus Christ who was raised up at the cross and be saved from your sins. But as I was saying concerning the law of God, concerning these commands, and we've obviously seen that we have broken them, that we have trampled them underfoot. So what is God's uh, justice? What is God's just punishment for this? If someone here in Greenville murders someone else, they must be found guilty in a court of law and punished for having broken the law. It is only just that a judge here would do that. And how much more God, the just judge of the universe, will punish the wicked in His wrath? Indeed, He will. He will punish the wicked. And so what is God's punishment for sin? It is hellfire. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said that hell is a place of outer darkness. He called it the unquenchable flame. And dear friends, I do not want you to go there. I really do not want you to perish in your sins and to be eternally crushed. Hell is real, friends. In fact, it's so real. Jesus Christ, the chief evangelist, the greatest teacher of all history, the central figure in all the Scripture, He spoke more on hell than He did on heaven. He referenced more the eternal damnation of ungodly souls than He did about the blissful rest of the righteous. Why? Because Christ loved sinners and He wanted to warn them. Friends, if I saw you walking down the street into a burning and you were about to step into a burning house that at any moment was to fall and to crash down and to turn into a pile of burning wood and rubble, it would only be loving and only be something which I ought to do in compassion. It would only be loving for me to cry out to you and say, do not burn, do not walk into this house that is on fire and die. In fact, if I didn't warn you, I would be hate-filled. It's interesting how people will criticize Christians who preach the truth by saying they're preaching hate. But if we truly believe that hell is real, would it not be the most loving thing that we could do is to warn the ungodly that they are going there and that they can flee it, that they can have refuge in Christ and be saved. Indeed, I say the most hateful Christian is the one who does not warn the wicked of hell and keeps his or her mouth shut and does not tell them that God's wrath is coming. That is that is truly the greatest evil monstrosity and the greatest injustice for a Christian who claims to believe the Bible but not to warn others about what it says. Jesus Christ described hell in Matthew 25 in these terms. He said in verse 41, and He's speaking of Himself on the day of judgment, what He will say to the wicked. He will say these words, Depart from Me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46, He describes furthermore what hell is like. He says, These will go away into eternal punishment. It never ends. That's the hopelessness of hell, friends. That it does not stop. 
but the agonies and tortures of the wicked and the torments of the damned continue on forever. The book of Revelation describes it as their smoke going up forever. It is a bottomless pit, dear friends. And I do not want you to go there. And so we find ourselves in this state, in this lost state, having broken God's law and having offended Him, having found ourselves condemned to hell without any hope. And we cannot placate God or bribe Him and try and earn a right standing before Him by our own religious works. We cannot. And so we are truly in the fullest sense hopeless. Hopeless without any hope. But my friends, I have good news. And this is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news. That God being rich in mercy, being great in love toward His people, yet never neglecting or never setting aside His holiness and His justice, but establishing it. He sent His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as Galatians 4.4 tells us, when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son, born under the law, born of a virgin. Christ Jesus came and He fulfilled the law that we broke. Every one of those commands of God that we have trampled underfoot, Christ Jesus kept them. He lived in submission to the will of the Father in His perfect life, something which none of us could attain to. In fact, listen to what Matthew 3 says. This is at the baptism of the Lord Jesus. It says in verse 17, A voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Who can God say that concerning? On earth, no one but His Son. Because no one has lived in perfect conformity and perfect obedience to God's law. No one has walked in absolute perfection. If someone says they are without sin, they have deceived themselves and the truth is not in them. They are self-deluded and most to be pitied. But Christ came and fulfilled those laws that we broke. How do we know this? Matthew 5.17 reads, do not, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. He did not come to do away with those commands, but to fulfill them in a, in a, in a glorious display of obedience to the will of the Father. And then after living that life of some 30 years on earth, He then went and He laid Himself down willingly. The Almighty God of glory, the One who controls all things, laid aside His privileges and limited His glory. He veiled His glory in His perfect life and He willingly laid Himself down as a ransom for sinners. He was betrayed by one of His disciples into the hands of sinful men and abandoned by the rest of them. And He was beat and whipped. He was found to be guilty of something which He did not commit. He was punished unjustly. He was spat upon, given a crown of thorns. And he was mocked. And then he was nailed to a Roman cross outside of Jerusalem some 2,000 years ago. And he suffered on that cross for those few hours as the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. See, this is the glory of the Gospel, friends. The cross of Jesus Christ is the perfect manifestation of God's love toward His elect and God's redeeming grace toward His church. It is a perfect display of God's holiness too. That God does not sweep sin under the rug and He does not forget the sins of the wicked. But He justly does away with them. At that cross, Jesus Christ cried out these words as, as Mark 15 records. He said, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At the cross, something was happened which the physical eye cannot see and did not see. And it is this, Isaiah 53, 10 says, It pleased the Lord to crush him. What is hell? What is the torment of hell? It is God unleashing His wrath upon the wicked. All throughout the Old Testament prophets and even in Romans 1.18, 
The Bible clearly speaks of God's wrath against the wicked. So that is what hell is, God unleashing His wrath on the wicked. However, what is the cross of Christ? It is God unleashing His wrath on His Son on behalf of His people. Jesus stood in my place. Jesus stood in my room, in my stead, and was punished for me. And that's what it means when Scripture talks about Christ dying for us. Christ died for His church. He laid His life down for His people. And at that cross, the Father counted Christ as if He was a sinner, as if He was a thief, as if He was a liar, as if He was a blasphemer, though He was perfect. The Father looked at His Son and counted Him a sinner, though He was sinless. And He poured out His wrath on Him. And that is why Isaiah 53.10 says, It pleased the Lord to crush Him. That is the love of God. That is the grace of God manifested and the righteousness of God that He does not sweep sin under the rug. In fact, if you were found guilty in a court of law for, let's say, murdering somebody, and you were found guilty, and you must go to prison for life, you're without hope. And you're going to have to be locked away. But at the last moment, as you're about to be cast into prison, if someone steps in onto the courtroom and they pay the bail, let's say your bail is $3 million, they pay it cash, you can leave the courtroom justly, having been forgiven by the judge. Yet justice was never neglected. That is the cross of Jesus Christ where God can show both kindness and grace yet still be holy and just. That's where God's attributes stand in beautiful harmony and unison with one another. But not only did Jesus die, but He rose from the grave. He rose from the grave on the third day. The Father rose His Son up as a public display that He had received his sacrifice as the payment for our sins. You could say that it is the receipt of Christ's transaction with the Father. What I mean by that is this. If I go to the store and I purchase a water bottle, let's say, they're going to give me a receipt and on the bottom of a lot of receipts it'll say, paid in full. And it is a piece of paper that validates that I had paid for the item that I walked out of the store with. It's validation. It's a legal authentication that I had paid for what I took out of the store. And the cross of Jesus Christ is the receipt. It's the legal authorization. God is saying, in effect, I've received the sacrifice of my Son. It is pleasing to me. It is enough for the forgiveness of sins. It is enough to save His people from their sin. You could say it was the Father saying, Amen to Jesus' it is finished. And after 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, after appearing to them on various occasions, in fact, at one point He appeared to more than 500 people at one time. He went to the top of the Mount of Olives and He ascended bodily into heaven. And He is seated in heaven today, right now at the right hand of majesty on high. He has done the work of salvation. He has completed the work of eternal redemption for His people. He died and rose and is risen and is ascended and has sat down. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. That is incredible, friends. He lives to do that. He lives to make intercession for the wicked and for the perverse, for the filthy. He lives, he lives to cleanse them from their sin, to save them from eternal damnation and eternal wrath. Here you go, sir. It's a gospel track. Yeah. What church are you in? Uh, I'm the pastor of the Spring Church. We're in Lawrence. Lawrence? Yes, sir. We're a little ways away. I'd encourage you. Um, Steve. Well, Baptist? Uh, yeah, we're Southern Baptist Church. Yep. Also, yeah, my friend Steve would love to talk with you. I'm going to continue to preach, but he'd love to speak with you. Oh, absolutely. I just want to see if I can get on that mic and say, give it away, give it away, give it away now. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're about well, I, I, I out some chili. You want some Yeah, yeah. I busting out some chili peppers. That's uh, which, which song did they cover for that? Excuse me about. Excuse me. Hey. 
it up. Make it loud. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, yep, they do. That's right. Thank you. God bless you, sir. Um, so, um, he's seated in heaven now, and he, uh, the Bible says that he reigns as king of the universe. Uh, and the Bible says that the Father is subjecting all things under his feet. In other words, what that means is simply this. He is reigning as king, and he is king over you. And when a king gives a decree and gives a command, his subjects must obey or be punished, be punished severely. And so here is the command. Here is the decree. The decree is not try and make yourself better. Try and earn salvation by your religious works. That is not the decree. That's not the command. The proper response to the gospel of Jesus Christ is found in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus simply says these words. Repent and believe the gospel. Two things. Firstly, you must repent. That is, you must flee your sin and let go of your rebellion and let go of your wickedness and flee unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You must repent of your pornography and your drunkardness and your selfishness, your idolatry, your pride, thinking that you can placate God and earn righteousness before Him by your work. And you must flee to Christ and believe Him. Believe the promises of God as they have been revealed in Holy Scripture. Believe that when God raised Christ up, that that truly is the divine guarantee that Christ had paid for the sins of God's people. That you take God at His Word. Repentance and faith is simply you fall before Christ and you say, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. You humble yourself in your weakness and you rely upon divine strength to save you. You rely on Christ fully. See, friends, there's only two religions in the world. There is human accomplishment and there is divine accomplishment. Which one will you find yourself in trying to earn salvation by your human accomplishment or instead resting in the fact that the Almighty God of glory has accomplished the work of salvation on your behalf. And therefore you know that you have been saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even the word grace means favor apart from merit. You don't merit it. Unlike what the Roman Catholic Church tells you, and unlike what the Pope, that blasphemous man who sets himself up against the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is a type of the Antichrist, Regardless of what him says or any man, salvation is by grace. Or regardless of what the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses tell you, salvation is by grace. Free grace. Free grace. You don't have to purchase it because it has been purchased by the precious blood of Christ. It is an affront to God. It is an offense to God to try and earn one's salvation by their performance. Because it's basically saying to God, God, what you did in Christ and what Christ has accomplished for me is not enough. But I must procure my own righteousness. My friends, Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 23, 6, Christ is our righteousness. He Himself is our righteousness. He is all that we would ever need. All that any man would ever need. Sir, if you do have a question, if you do have a, if you do have a question, we would like you to ask it, but we'd ask you not to heckle through the microphone. So, friends, I exhort you. That's what the sinner must do: repent and believe. And here's the promise of the gospel: the sinner who flees their sin and trusts in Christ alone will be forgiven of all their sins, every last one of the sins which they have committed. There is no one too filthy for Christ. There is no one too sinful for the Savior. His power is unlimited, and His saving grace is like a great and mighty sea, and our sin is drowned in it. Friends, Christ is an able Savior. 
And so all your sin, if you repent and believe on Christ, will be forgiven of you, and you will be given the righteousness of Christ. God will count you as if you lived Jesus' life because He counted Christ as if He lived your life. That's the exchange of the Gospel. That God looks at His Son and treats His Son as if He lived my life, and then He turns and treats me as if I lived His Son's life. That's a perfect exchange. It's so glorious. The grace, mercy, and kindness that God has revealed in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So whether you are young or whether you are old, whether the sinner is rich or, pure or poor, whether the sinner is black or white, Christ is the sufficient Savior. And He is the Savior for all man. John 3.16 itself says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. God's love is not limited to a specific ethnic group, but it is for all different types of people. And so, the sinner must flee to Christ while there is still time. And they will be adopted as a child of God by the free grace of God and for the glory, honor, and praise and exaltation of God. And even this is for the Christian even. This is for the child of God to feed and to rest upon daily. This is our manna from heaven, our daily bread, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is for the Christian to proclaim to a lost and dying world so that this lost and dying world might find hope in Christ. And as we have addressed here and considered in Romans 2, the religious yet lost person. This Gospel is certainly for the religious but lost person. And what I mean by that is the person who perhaps here in the South has grown up in church, who perhaps has said a prayer and walked an aisle, and who has been assured by a preacher that they are saved who has perhaps been baptized, or is even a deacon or a pastor in a church, but is still lost and still inwardly a ravenous wolf. This Gospel is for them. That is right, dear friends. There are many of you, I, I am sure of this fact, there are many of you who say you're Christian, but you're lost. You're lost. And you're not converted. How can I say such a thing? Two reasons. Firstly, because of the authority of Scripture. Because the Bible says that. And I'll get to that in a moment but also because I lived in that state for eight years. I said myself to be a Christian. I claimed to be a follower of Christ, but I was dead in sin, and I lived in blatant rebellion against God's will for my life. I cared not of the things of God, nothing for prayer, nothing for reading God's Word or sharing the Gospel with the lost. I was lost. I thought I was saved simply because I said some goofy little prayer that didn't save me. I wasn't saved. No one is saved by asking Jesus into their heart. No one is saved by saying a prayer. People are saved by the free grace of Jesus Christ, not by something they do. American evangelical Christianity has been reduced to some ritualistic system of work salvation whereby the sinner is brought to simply say some prayer, have a religious experience, and then they're good to go. They have salvation like it's some sort of flu shot. That's not salvation. Salvation is a recreation of the inward man. Salvation is, is, as the Bible describes it, regeneration. Where God takes the sinful man and recreates him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Are you a new creation? This is what the, the person who claims to be a Christian needs to ask themselves. Am I a new creation? Before I was converted, and now, is there a difference? Am I different or am I just the same as I was? If so, you're lost. It is not that we are justified or that we are saved by our works. We are saved by God's free grace. 
But the result of being saved by God's sovereign saving grace is a changed life, is a changed action, is changed deeds and, and disposition of spirit. We will be known by our works. Actions speak louder than words, dear friends. Your actions speak louder than what you say with your mouth. Let us say for a moment that I was married and I told my wife that I loved her, but then I committed adultery with multiple women. Would I truly love her? No, I'd be lying. Your actions confirm what you say with your mouth. So if you say you follow Christ, but you're a slave to pornography, and you're a slave to your drunkenness, and you're a slave to the things of the world, and you're a slave to selfishness and pride, you're not a Christian. And I would ask you to stop calling yourself a Christian. I would ask you to say, to renounce your false pseudo-Christianity so that people like me, true Christians and other genuine followers of Christ, can genuinely share the gospel with the lost and dying world. And for the false convert, here is my challenge. Repent and believe the gospel. It's the same for the unbeliever who is openly an unbeliever. You must repent and believe the gospel. Turn from your hypocrisy and turn to Christ. Listen to what 1 John 2 says. This is what the Bible says concerning this. Verse 3, it says, By this we know that we have come to know Him. If we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word in him, the love of God has been truly perfected. What's he saying? He's saying, you want to know if someone's been genuinely converted. It's whether they act differently. It's whether their life has been changed by the grace of God. That's the evidence of conversion. He continues in verse 5, By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself also to walk in the same manner as he walked. Ask yourself simply. This is what the false convert needs to ask himself. Do I walk as Christ walked and live as Jesus lived? If not, you're lost. The false convert has proven himself or herself to be lost. Another place, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said this, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I don't want any of you here today or this evening to be one of those people that on the day of judgment are turned away even though you think yourself to be saved, ask yourself, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith and follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. In reference to the Gospel, in reference to what I just preached on a few minutes ago, the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Christ, why did God do this? What is the chief end and design of all this? It is all to the glory of God. Salvation is all to the glory of God. God acts and brings about the salvation of His people so that He is glorified. And so it ought to be the desire of all people to seek after the glory of God. To bring God glory in their lives by obeying Him and submitting to Him and walking in His truth. Listen to what Psalm 115 verse 1 says. The psalmist writes, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, 
but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness because of your truth see God has done all that he has done in sending his son into the world to save sinners for his own glory to bring praise and honor and worship to his holy name God is for God and so give God the glory dear friends for the great things that he has done in his son Listen to what Hebrews 13 says in verse 20. The writer of Hebrews writes these words, Now to the God of now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant even Jesus our Lord equip you in every good deed to do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen and amen. It's all to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you lost souls. What did the Lord Jesus say in Matthew 11? He said, Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Flee to Christ! Don't lose your soul for your sins. Be awakened from your slumber of sin and flee to Christ alone for eternal life. He is the Lord of glory, the King of the ages, the rock of salvation, the eternal God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, the Holy One of Israel, the Great I Am, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Friends, you ungodly souls, flee to Him. Even the hymn writer wrote these words, which I find to be beloved. He said, Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me Savior, or I die. That ought to be the posture of every person's heart this evening. To flee to Christ for soul cleansing to soul cleansing, so that they are saved. And for you Christians, I exhort you, fellow saints, to preach this gospel to a lost and dying world and to offer Christ freely to everyone you come into contact with and to obey and honor Him out of gratitude for what He has done for us. And as I addressed a few minutes ago, you false converts, you religious people, yet still lost, I challenge you to run from your religious hypocrisy to Christ. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that religious hypocrites count God's kindness, tolerance, and patience lightly. But we saw that even more glorious truth in, at the second part of verse 3, that, the God, that God's kindness leads us to repentance. Leads sinners to repentance. So friends, indeed, God is so kind. God is so kind. And He has revealed it by sending His Son Jesus to die and to rise again on behalf of sinners. And so to this God, to the God of glory, to the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three and three in one, to Him be glory forever. Amen.